Initiative, the Africa Program, and the Wilson Center, I'd like to welcome you today to our conversation with Ms. Adil Ibrahim on encouraging African youth to enter public service. I think a very timely conversation, especially here in the United States as we're working through the conventions in an election season. And I actually just got off a plane um, from a summit of w encouraging women leaders to enter po politics in Dakar, Senegal. And uh, had the distinct pleasure of meeting two new, very young candidates that are gonna run for local elections next year and talking about exactly what it means to be a candidate. So I'm happy to have you all here today. Today we're gonna have a conversation with Hadil Ibrahim, and I know that you have her bio, but a, you know, a few facts about Hadil. She is the, the founding and the executive director of the Mo Ibrahim Foundation. She's also the co-chair of the Africa Center in New York, which opened in August 2014, and I believe we'll talk about today. In 2016, she was elected as 100 under 40, the, most, the world's most influential young Arabs. And in May 2016, she was appointed to the United Nations Secretary General's high-level panel of experts to address humanitarian financing. So she can speak across a variety of issues. But what I find truly interesting is a, is a quote with an interview with her and her father, I believe, in 2013 with Al Jazeera, where she said, I think it's an exciting time to be a young woman at this moment in the world, and especially to be a young black woman. There's no other time in the history of the world that I could be doing what I'm doing. I could be sitting in room talking to older men from other cultural backgrounds, and they have to listen. So Hadil, I look forward to talking with you today. Thank you. How are you? I'm very well. So welcome good to after, Washington. Good afternoon, morning, afternoon, morning. <laughs> morning. Good morning, one of you. So why don't you tell me a little bit about the Mo Ibrahim Foundation and what you're, what you're doing now. And the, I know you have four or three pillars of work with the fellowships in the African Governance Index. Right. Why don't you tell us what the foundation's working on right now? Sure, I mean, I, I'll give a little bit of background because I don't know how much you know generally about the foundation, but really the foundation was set up 10 years ago. And we really felt that Africa's underdevelopment was largely attributable to uh, a failure of leadership. And uh, most African countries had been liberated for about 50 years. And if you look at the GDP per capita of Ghana in 1957, it was higher than the GDP per capita of Singapore, of Thailand, of Malaysia. So we can't attribute everything to the colonial period. We have to say, well, what's happened since the end of colonization that has led us to be where we are today? And we have to take some ownership. And I'm someone that, um, I think it's a lot easier when you take ownership for what you're doing wrong because you can fix that. And I think when you create narratives which are about what others are doing to you, it's very difficult to change that. Now, that's not to say that colonialism wasn't insidious. That's not to say that the Cold War in some ways wasn't even worse. That's not to say that even today, the way that the UN Security Council functions, the way that you know, all our global governance architecture is skewed against Africa. We are systematically discriminated against. However, there are certain things we can take ownership of, and leadership and governance, how we manage our own societies is one of them. So we have two initiatives. Um, so we have several initiatives, but the two that we're most sort of known for are our prize and our index. And they speak to the two sides of governance and leadership. So the way we define governance is risk management. And the way we define leadership is risk taking. Mm -hmm. So you want your head of state to be a risk taker, but you want your ca the cabinet around that person to be risk managers. So the prize recognizes the leadership side, someone who comes in constitutionally, does a great job, and leaves when they're supposed to leave. Mm -hmm. On the governance side, we have our index where since 2000, we must have something in the region of about 90,000 data points by now, where across all 54 countries in Africa, 140 odd variables, we measure how every government is performing against each other. And when we first launched the index, we actually used to take out radio adverts and newspaper adverts and say, Kenya, your country's number 19, Uganda's number 15. Ask your government why. And it was really interesting to see that kind of competitive, almost soccer-like uh, energy put on to why is our neighbor doing better than us because all Kenyans would assume that Kenya outperforms Uganda. So that was a really interesting way we felt of um, creating a 
kind of discussion. And I think both initiatives were very important because they allowed, they were mechanisms by which people could have conversations that weren't really had before. You may have had an incumbent head of state for 30 years in your country, but there wasn't really a legitimate mechanism for sort of addressing that without being a troublemaker. Exactly. When you have a prize like ours, um, it created the mechanism why there could be a national discussion around why is an art president a candidate. And so I think that was quite a useful, um, I think it was a useful contribution. It was a controversial contribution, but an interesting one. And in fact, several heads of state have talked about how they want to win the prize. Several heads of state have talked about why they stepped down when they did because they hoped to win the prize. So we've seen it change behavior already in, in the 10 years that it's been running. Let me follow up on a couple of that. I know it's a, it's a question you get asked often, but the years that the prize committee did not select a winner, mm -hmm. how, is that, how would you message that or what would be the message in sort of continuing the dialogue and the positive energy the years you did not select a winner? I mean, I think there's a, it's a prize for excellence in leadership. Excellence is not relative. So one year, if there's a less exciting group of people, we don't lower the bar. Um, excuse my language, but to correct my father, we don't reward any old crap just because it's African. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think when you have someone like Mary Robinson, uh, the former Irish president who's on the prize committee, she would always say, look, if I was on this committee and it was an award in Europe, we wouldn't have given it for 10 years. Exactly. So, so no excuses for Africa. A absolutely no excuses. I mean, think of a European leader in the last 10 years who you think maybe Merkel when she leaves. I struggle to think of another leader in the last 10 years in Europe who I would say was worthy of an award for excellence. So I think the fact that we've had four leaders in 10 years is pretty good. I think so as well, I think. and just recently. So uh, related to that conversation, one of the stats that's out there is, you know, the median age in Africa is 19.5, right? Mm -hmm. I think 60% of the population across the continent mm -hmm. is under the age of 30. And the average age of the 10 oldest leaders is 78.5. Mm -hmm. So where does that, that gap in age fall? And how does that dovetail with African leaders being in power for over 30 years? I think it's definitely a challenge we face. That kind of demographic chasm between those being led and those who lead is, is one of the biggest challenges we face because it's very difficult for a 70-year-old to see the world through, through the eyes of a 17-year-old. Um, and I continually make the point that in African, by African standards, I'm middle-aged. And so I very much resist being called a young leader because I'm not. Mm -hmm. If I was 19, I'd be a young leader. You know, I'm in my 30s. I'm middle-aged in the African context. <laughs> you have to accept because you make the point. You make the point. And actually, you know, I, would, I, I think it's, you know, dropping below 19 and more interesting. I mean, look, by 2050, half of the young people in the world will be Africans. So one of the big challenges we really face, and we're at 20 million people entering the labor market every yeah, year, I think say. something like that. So I, it, the big challenge that we face is how we harness that immense resource that is the youth of Africa, our, our biggest natural resource are our people. Our people. Um, and I think it's really, really challenging because look, globally there's a disaffection with politics. Um, you see that playing out at the moment in US politics. You see that playing out in, I'm a, I'm a British citizen. So a lot's being played out in the UK at the moment. Um, there, is a, there is a distrust of public institutions. And I would argue a legitimate distrust. You know, these are institutions that we've been knocking on the doors for decades, arguing for reform and they haven't reformed, so people have lost faith in institutions. And I think, I think it's gonna be very hard to win back that faith. And I think it's very hard. I used to do a lot of kind of leadership, public speaking in Africa, and it's very hard when a 17 year old turns to you and says, but why? Why should I? Why should I enter a system that is systematically weighted against me? But how do you create that interest? And I guess who does create that interest? Who does create that, the interest to go into the system or the interest to engage with the system? Um, so to be provocative, my, my response to that would be, we have this unique demographic bulge in Africa, right? Where let's say 50% under 18, right? 
and that's going to drop. So my argument was always and remains, why burn down the presidential palace when you can live in it? In the next decade, you'll be able to win an election without anyone over the age of 30 voting for you. So wait your time. You don't need to wait. Take the system, legitimately. What do African governments need to do in order to reach out to these youth? Because they have an interest in harnessing. They have an interest right now in sort of staying in power and staying connected. What would, what's your advice on how they're going to either engage or reach out to this community? My argument would be, I think the leadership generation needs to create opportunities up to and within their own offices, presidential offices, cabinets for young people, and that's also succession planning. Mm -hmm. And it's only where you don't see that happening systematically across the continent that you have to create an alternative narrative for young people that says, okay, fine, create your own movements. Because we have seen how difficult it is to, we do, ha as you said, we do have this kind of overriding narrative in Africa that says, wait your turn. And, you know, I have to say, when I started running the foundation, I was 22, and I experienced ageism in Africa and sexism in the global north. I didn't encounter so much sexism in Africa, which people find surprising, but the ageism was tough. And so you have a generation or two of young people who I think, are, if they're not given opportunities to do things, will just become disillusioned. And politics is traditionally not the space where young people are given opportunity. And I think 99% of the talented young people I meet on the continent want to go into business because they see a pathway to success. If you're good enough, you're old enough. And unfortunately, that doesn't obtain in politics. So I do suspect that the trend we're going to see is going to have to be youth movements led by young people for young people, and that idea that you can just take on the system, you can get enough votes, there's enough young people, um, which in and of itself is a legitimate democratic exercise. I mean, it may sound subversive, but much better that than generation after generation of social unrest and revolutions we've seen in North Africa where that leads us. Let's talk about that youth movement a little bit. I think across the world is the discussion of the use of technology. Mm -hmm. So how would you suggest in, in building that, that movement and what about the role of technology? And also in that, I think, is where are these youths in Africa? Most of them are in urban areas, if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about the role technology is playing or should play in creating that space? I mean, I think the role of technology can be somewhat overestimated when it comes to organizing. You know, there was a lot of talk about, when we talk about the North African revolutions, the Arab Spring, um, that Twitter did this or Facebook did this, and actually it was people standing in front of tanks. I mean, that's what it was. It was, you know, I mean, it helped them mobilize, but in the end, it's people that sound like an advanced petition never brought down a government, as far as I've seen. So that kind of clicktivist mentality that it's enough to kind of be part of something digitally, I'm not convinced by. And actually, I think it is when people take to the streets and people are willing to put their lives on the line that change happens. Um, so... The role of technology, absolutely, it's an enabler in terms of helping people, information flows and so on. But I question to what extent some of the old traditional organizing skills are being forgotten. One of our foundation board members and a great mentor to me, Jane Idu, built the trade union movement in South Africa. And in fact was running the trade union movement, Kasatu, when he was 27. Mm -hmm. and you know, you build it from the shop floor. You go from factory to factory and you enlist people and that's how you get a one million member organization where people are paying subscribers. And it's a real thing. And I think we're somehow demeaning the significance of that and pretending that this digital space that we've created is a legitimate substitute for human engagement, organizing contact and being present. So technology absolutely has a role to play, but. I think what has a bigger role to play is organizing. Can you touch a bit on that? How is civil society or civic groups doing across the continent? The continent's very varied. I know it depends on countries, but 
you touched a little bit sort of in the world today that, that sort of people are coming out and, and calling for a change, mm -hmm. I guess, in, in the UK, I suppose. Um, arguably the numbers weren't that many of the younger generation calling for the end, but what's the state of civil society or civic activism, would you say? I, mean, I think Africa re reflects a broader gro global trend. The global trend is a closing of civic space, and you see that everywhere in the world. Um, and Africa ref reflects that. I think it's never been more important to have a robust civil society. It's never been more challenging to have a robust civil society. Um, and this is one of the challenges of technology. I'm sounding kind of like a Luddite. I apologize. I'm a big fan of technology, but um, <laughs> I apologize. But um, surveillance has never been easier. Knowing what you're thinking and writing and saying to people has never been easier. It's easier now for a government to be aware of what you're doing as an activist group or as a civil society group than it was in 1980 where they actually had to come and physically tap your phone. Yep. They had to physically follow you. You know, the mobile phone is an incredibly empowering device, but it also means that government knows everything you're doing all the time. And, and I'm not saying government's the enemy, whoever. Whoever is able to access that knows what you're doing, when you're doing, who you're contacting. So I think technology has been a huge enabler, but it's also been it threatens the civic space. It makes it much easier for civil society organizations doing legitimately challenging work um, to be monitored, to be shut down. Um, so, I mean, trying to speak in defense of that. In the end, it's value neutral, right? Technology is not good, it's not bad, it's what we use it for. And we seem to be more skilled at the moment it's at using it for bad things. All the problems. Well, we've just figured out more bad applications than good applications, and we need to kind <laughs> of correct the balance a bit. Let's switch gears a little bit. Tell us about the Africa Center. Happily. Um, so the Africa Center, I have to correct, it hasn't actually opened yet, so it's okay. not open. But uh, the Africa Center really was an attempt to engage the US in Africa. So the US has really become quite disengaged from Africa, and you can see that as a trend over the part, uh, certainly over the 10 years that I've been at associated with the foundation. Um, the U.S. is now the third biggest investor in Africa, which, considering it's the largest global economy, is, is, is sort of below where it should be, and a distant third. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that is to do, I, I feel, with the lack of awareness and education in this country about Africa and the fact that Africa is an opportunity. Africa is the story of the 21st century. It's not, um, you don't always have to mediate America's engagement with Africa through the prism of slavery to be blunt mm -hmm. you know the africa africa the africa story is not only a function of the african-american story and i think unfortunately it raises so many sensitivities in this country that people sort of try and shut it down or we start talking about ebola or we start talking about corruption so there's this real need to sort of say actually 54 countries 1 billion people 60 percent of the world's natural resources going to be 3 billion people in 50 years so what is the narrative around trade, either from engaging with Africa or potentially coming back to this youth question and creating employment? Because you, you mentioned trade as a way to engage and think about the continent. Yeah, I mean, we were doing some work with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and they said, in their view, U.S. companies had a two-year window to get smart on Africa or they'd be locked out of the growth story of the 20th, 21st century. I thought that was in the U.S. Chamber of Commerce not me promoting Africa. Um, I thought that was interesting. You know, there, there is so much opportunity. Um, we're a continent of entrepreneurs. And how do you get America, the country that virtually invented entrepreneurship, to see that and to engage with that? So really, the Africa Center is an attempt to do that. We have a 70,000 square foot space focusing on business policy and culture but through the prism of youth and technology. So we're building the space out with MIT. And so it's effectively an Afrofuturist institute, by which I mean people will come to the Africa Center to see the future of Africa and therefore the future of the world. So we're looking at robot agriculture. I mean, some of the things they do at MIT slightly mystify me, robot but it's extraordinary. Agriculture. Robot agriculture, so greenhouses where you can completely replicate gr growing conditions in Africa. You can also do climate prospecting, so we can model in these greenhouses what climate change will do to 
a certain region in the Sahel and start figuring out from now what to grow, when to grow, how to grow it. Um, whole range, we can grow seeds from some of the international seed banks of plants that haven't been seen for 250 years. It's kind of extraordinary. So that's one of the things we'll be doing there. We'll have obviously a fabrication lab, 3D printing, 3D milling, so people can come and kind of engage with the future of manufacturing. Um, and of course, performance art, visual art, all of that. So it's really this exciting and, and dynamic space where you see things that you didn't expect and it throws the African narrative forward rather than always sort of have it being dragged behind through history and misperception. How is that controversial question on that I want to follow up in is what you're talking about with agriculture and MIT and innovation here, how is that being translated and communicated back to the continent where you, you know, and youth's interest in going into agriculture versus sort of urban entrepreneurship and, and selling things? Not that, af, not that agriculture is not entrepreneurship, but one of the challenges in the agricultural space, again, like yeah. politics, is youth interest. Absolutely. I mean, 80% of young people don't want to work in agriculture. And um, I think what's interesting when you start bringing a sort of sophisticated technology dimension to agriculture is it suddenly maybe becomes more attractive to young people because it's suddenly tech ag or mm -hmm. however you want to abbreviate it. So then, you know, you can suddenly see how people that are engaged with coding or with engineering in some form can see a way into the agriculture space. So I think even just the fact of um, the fact that there's an opportunity to view agriculture through the prism of technology is a way in for a group of young people or for a sector of young people who would otherwise never be interested in farming. Yeah, to regain interest. Um, I'm going to put my global women's leadership hat on for a moment and talk about, and you talked a little bit about, um, to, to paraphrase you a bit, experiencing more gender discrimination in the global north mm -hmm. than perhaps on the continent. And Africa actually is a continent from women's leadership having female presidents, mm -hmm. ranks quite well amongst yeah. the world. Um, how, how do you view the role of women going into politics and the interest in politics? And is attracting women any different at this age than attracting the under 30 crowd generally? Um. I see some African men in the room, so I please tell me if you disagree. <laughs> but, um, you know, the matriarch in the African imagination is a very powerful figure. Women do 80 to 90 percent of Africa's agricultural, produce 80 to 90 percent of Af Africa's agricultural output. So the women are the ones farming, they're the ones bringing up the children, they often hold the purse strings. They're the ones doing the work. And, um, I would contend that every African man I've ever met is afraid of his mother. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Yes. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> it's true. I don't think the mother, the matriarch in the Western imagination occupies that. I don't think many of my American friends are scared of their mothers. So I think when you map that matriarch into the political space, and there's still a lot of work to be done, people intuitively kind of get it. They're like, oh yes, I know the powerful, yes. I know what that is. That's like my mother or my grandmother, and I don't want to upset her. I must listen to her. There's, there, is a, there is a paradigm in the African imagination that understands the strong woman. I'm not sure that exists to the same extent in the Western imagination. So we don't have enough women in leadership roles, but when they get there, I mean, like the head of the African Union is a woman. You think they understand that? What about the time burden that. argument, though? The what, sorry? Time burden. I mean, women are producing 80 to 90 percent of the agriculture. They're also in many This is not to diminish children. any of the real life challenges being faced. We do not have title to land. We do not have the time burden, absolutely discriminatory policies. And it's not to diminish any of those things. But I do think strong women are an understood phenomenon on the continent. And I think that's to our advantage. And now we have to follow what's happened in the global north and create the legislative framework that allows us to follow through. Um, equal pay, recourse to maternity leave, all of that, absolutely that has to happen. But I find that um, the African women in the non, you know, outside of Africa, people assume African women are terribly discriminated against and beaten down, and I haven't, I've seen discrimination, I've seen violence against women, but 
the absolute strength of African women is extraordinary, and it's understood by men. The they may their fear voice. it, they yeah. may oppress it, but it's known. It's absolutely known. And um, I don't know, I don't know, do people agree? Do they disagree? Am I being controversial? <laughs> but it's known, you know. I see a couple of nods in the audience, but I think uh, you might have some, we might get some questions on that. Please, please, please. But, um, I think that, you know, when the voice is heard, do you think the women were giving more voice and more platform to other you know, as they say in, in the academic studies, other segments of society, young women, youth, sort of bringing in different perspectives once they do get into those positions, whether it's at a community level or it's up at, at a presidential level. Absolutely. I mean, I think the key is diversity. The big challenge we face everywhere in the world, but especially on the continent, is managing diversity. You have a country of 100 million people with 30 ethnic groups or 20 million people with 50 ethnic groups with a range of cultures, languages, religions. How do you manage diversity? And I think the more diverse voices are around the table formulating public policy, the more likely those policies are to be successful. And I think where you haven't seen that diversity in the past is when you've seen, you know, leadership that focused on the interests of a specific ethnic group or a specific religious group. So. I don't know how you could even think about formulating inclusive public policy unless you have a multiplicity of voices around the table. So to your point, absolutely. The more women we see in public life, you'll have this kind of multiplier effect in terms of the, not just gender sensitivity, but just sophistication of our policies. Of, what, of the policies and what they should be. Well, let's link that to a bit about the governance narrative that you started to talk about with the prize and the fellowship and the governance model. What is the governance narrative today? As you said, when you come to the Global North, many people think it's all about trying to keep away war and keep conflict to a mini minimum or potentially keep ethnic diversity going. What is the governance discussion you know, on the continent today, would you say? I think that issue of managing diversity is key. Um, I think we, there's so much need that the other thing, I mean, I would, what another way I talked about risk management, another way of sort of defining governance is the most efficient translation of resources into outcomes. Mm -hmm. You know what we want to achieve, or well, we know the minimum that people should have educationally or in terms of health services, infrastructure, people need power. We know what outcomes are needed and we have limited resources. How do you get from A to B with as little wastage as possible on the way? I would define that as the biggest governance challenge that we face. Is the resources? The most, the effective translation of resources into outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's the big challenge that we face. Um, Last questions before I throw that in there because it brings in um, the discussion of, you talked a little bit about the role of the U.S. Mm -hmm. Little, we touched not particularly on aid, but I think aid, aid whether it's humanitarian financing aid, bilateral aid, let's talk, stay away from that for a second. We'll open that up for questions I know. Talk about the private sector and the role they have in the governance discussion and the role they have in governance on the continent with the rise of entrepreneurship, as you mentioned. Yeah, no, absolutely, the private sector will be the engine, and is already, but will be the engine of Africa's development. I think, on the one hand, the private sector historically hasn't always played the most, um, hasn't always lived up to the highest standards of corporate governance. On the other hand, if we look at the sort of NGO sector, of which I am a part, so I acknowledge this, Many NGOs are less transparent than corporations. Corporations. You know, many NGOs have leaders that have been there for 20 or 30 years. You know, so there is a governance narrative that cuts across all of the institutions that we need to... But I think sometimes corporations get given a hard time for the sake of it by activist groups who themselves are not doing what they're accusing the company of doing in terms of accountability and transparency. So I think we just need to be very consistent across the board and no one should get a free pass. So before I throw it over for questions, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you the hard question, right? The three qualities of good governance. You've talked a bit about good governance being the ability to, to cede power and not be there for 30 years. Mm -hmm. You've talked a bit about the ability of good governance to take in 
diversity standpoints. And I don't know, perhaps you want to use um, the recent governance award in Namibia, but mm -hmm. if you had to boil it down to sort of three qualities of good governance, what would you say those qualities would I be? Say, I'm going to use really <laughs> boring governance speak. I apologize. Uh, accountability, transparency, efficiency. Okay. So we've got anything from youth to women to trade to the narrative in the global north, technology. Um, refugees. Yeah, refugees. We haven't even, I mean, Hadil really wants this to be a conversation. So for that, in that vein, I would like to open it up for questions. We do have microphones. What I would love if you would do would be to introduce yourself. And I would also, and I know we would all appreciate it, if you would also keep it as much as you can to a question with a question mark at the end and as brief as possible so that we can really try to have an exchange here and really try to kind of hear all different types of questions and perspectives. So why don't we start over here and then we'll come over to the right and swing back down here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning. My name is uh, Ni Akwete and with apologies, I just walked in. Moreover, I looked at the title and um, I almost read it to say gray-haired people need not come. <laughs> but I am here precisely because I'm gray-haired. I've been an advocate in Washington for almost 40 years. And my appeal is that I think the focus on youth is wonderful, but it has to be intergenerational so that another advocate doesn't spend 40 years learning what I have learned. So how can you partner the gray-haired people with the young people so they can learn very quickly what took us decades to learn? Thank you. Great, and I think what we'll do is we'll take two or three questions. So I think we, we've got this two females right here. Thank you, Leah. Yeah, hi, my name is Doha, I'm an Atlas Corps fellow from Sudan. Uh, so my question is, uh, how does the Africa Center, uh, what is the plan of the, uh, for the Africa Center of working on inclusive, uh, inclusivity among the diverse African uh, youth? And the other thing is that what is the plan to engage U.S. Uh, government, as you said, with youth in countries like Sudan who are facing economic sanctions, which, you know, literally blocks the youth from doing pretty much everything? So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, my name is also Nadia Taha from Sudan. Uh, I'm Atlas Co Fellow, uh, working with Voice of America. Uh, what I would like to say that I'm originally from Darfur and from conflict zone. You talked about the governors. And I just want to talk about the women in the refugees camp and IDPs camp, how the Africa Center can work with them closely, um, even the youth. Like oh, most of our youth in Africa, especially Sudan and, and Somalia and this side, now they decide to cross the Mediterranean to they are going to die. Like what the African Center can offer for them to, to stay in a the country? They don't have to cross the Mediterranean and they go and die in the sea. Thank you. So you've got, how do you bring intergenerational dialogue? How do you reach and work with youth in almost, quote unquote, impossible situations to paraphrase and uh, diversity as well? Um, you ask difficult questions. Um, <laughs> on intergenerational leadership, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, it's, I take the provocative position. Of course, we need intergenerational, I mean, before when I said young people just take the country, you don't need anyone over 30 to, vote for you to still win an election now. But um, I've been very lucky. I've worked with a lot of senior leaders. I've been mentored by wonderful people like Salim Ahmed Salim. And you look at that generation and the wisdom that they have absolutely is something that young people must leverage so that we don't make the same mistakes again and again and again. And I think there are some extraordinary leaders. We've attempted to highlight some through the prize who were there, who were ready, and who were willing to engage with young people. But there are many who are not. And I think it's difficult if you're a 19-year-old activist in country X. How do you find your way to the former president of Mozambique to get advice? And I know those gentlemen, they do a lot, a lot, a lot of youth work and engaging and speaking at universities. But it's not easy um, to build those bridges. But you know, I hope in our way with the foundation by making some of these former presidents visible, by giving them the resources to continue to have life after office, to be able to go and speak, to build their own foundations, to tell their own stories. I hope in some way we've made our contribution to that kind of intergenerational leadership that you talk about. But I recognize it's, it's a small contribution, but hopefully a meaningful one. Um, the second question was, 
apologize. Yeah, reaching out to youth, South Sudan. Inclusivity, sanctions. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The role of the Africa Center is not necessarily to be an aid agency. It's not necessarily to be an advocacy organization on specific issues. The role of the Africa Center is really to provide a beacon where 54 African countries are represented in the global imagination in a positive way, where we talk about what's good, we talk about what's wrong. And it's an interesting challenge because we're a startup institution, so I've been thinking about these things a lot, and I think. Institutions are only interesting when they have a point of view, right? Like they sort of stand for something. If you try and stand for everything, it's just kind of a mess. Um, but having said that, if you become too activist as an institution on specific issues, what happens when you get it wrong? Is the whole credibility of the Africa Center in crisis? Does that mean everything else we talk about, we're also wrong? Does that mean Africa is wrong? I mean, you know, the media narratives become very simplistic. If we get it wrong on something, Africa is a disaster, again. So I think we have to be very strategic about what we choose. I think we can talk principles. I think we can talk ideas. Would the Africa Center convene something around the issue of sanctions? Would we convene some economic analysis? a paper or research work around the impact of sanctions, like how efficient are sanctions, who's affected by sanctions. I think that is a piece of intellectual work is really interesting. So I think we want to address the difficult questions, um, but we want to do them in a way that is universal and that um, could apply to countries beyond Africa even, right? That you could take the analysis or the analogy that we're making and apply it to North Korea or you could apply it to Iran or anywhere. You know, I, I, I'm very interested in a, in a principled, value-driven approach rather than a specific country approach when it comes to policy work. And what role, before we ask another question, follow up on that, with the people that are on the ground, you talked about NGOs, you know, that are, that are on the ground often working in these situations in Darfur and South Sudan mm -hmm. on education or yeah. on those programs. What role are they playing in this narrative, the Africa Center and the, you know, you talked potentially about research or potentially at convenings. How do you view them vis-a-vis -vis what the Africa Center is trying to do? I mean, I think we're a platform to showcase what's happening on the continent. So I think, you know, we're, we're holding a mirror up to what's happening and some of it's fantastic and some of it's not great. But maybe for the first time, that mirror is being held by Africans and we have some kind of control over what's being shown or not shown for a change. Um, that in and of itself, right? Yeah, and that in and of itself is pretty revolutionary. More questions? I know I saw it. Wow. Um, why don't we continue on this side, and then we'll come across over here. Good morning. You, you uh, Eric Michel Sosuglu. I'm an investment advisor. You touched up the, the, the issue of ageism, and uh, mm. it, it leads into renewal of, of elite. You know, it, on the continent, it's true. You know, your credibility sometimes, you know, comes down to a trivial thing, how much greater you can show. And uh, unfortunately, you have a renewal of elite where young people um, are instrumentalized in rebellions or have to take weapons to ascend to power. So wha what is your center is going to do, you know, besides what the foundation has been doing to promote, you know, some different type of, uh, of, of young African elite, you know. Uh, that, that's my question. Thank you. Thank you. What are we going to do to promote an, a new young African elite? Yeah, different than the one that, you know, almost is forced into taking weapons to, you know, ascend to power or be represented in politics. I mean, I just have a feeling like the African Center <laughs> is being held responsible for those <laughs> things. Um, It's very, very difficult when it comes to, it's very difficult. It's difficult to uh, implant democracy. And it's very difficult to build great young leadership. And everyone tries to do it. And everyone does leadership training. And it's something I was quite resistant to in the foundation because I think you end up picking winners who are already going to win. If I have to do a fellowship program or I have to pick a scholar and 5,000 CVs land on my desk, I'm going to pick the one who's got the best track record. They're going to do fine anyway. 
right? I mean, I have an obligation to pick the person pick I think is going to do the best. Yeah. And that's the kid that went into Harvard or this. I mean, like, and they're going to be fine. I think it's very, very difficult to get into the business in a thoughtful way of leadership. I've seen amazing CVs of people that I thought had extraordinary leadership qualities, not just in a foundation context, and I've been on selection panels, but I wasn't empowered to pick them. I had to pick the person according to the criteria who ticked these boxes. So I think it's very difficult when you talk about what's the center going to do. I mean, it's tough. You know, leadership like that is self-selecting. I mean, who at the age of 19 would have gone, oh, Barack Obama, he's going to be president? Right? I mean, so without sort of referencing JFK too much, but like, you know, not what the Africa Center can do for you. <laughs> what, what you can, can do, do for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> what you can do for yourself, I like yeah. that, as opposed to the... Yeah. But it's also interesting when you think about that in context of other things, like the YALI, Young African Leaders Initiative, what comes out of the State Department, and it's who comes out of that program, It's right? tough, and you see this, and, and uh, you know, God bless all of, all of us, but I have a peer group, and we've all cycled through, uh, sort of people my age and about 10 years older, and I see the same people everywhere. And they're like, oh, you're on this board now. Yeah, oh, you're, oh, you're speaking on this panel. Actually, because there's like 50 of us, <laughs> right? And we're the, like this sort of leadership generation. You're on and everybody's. it just cycles around. And people are like, oh, have you? And, 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 and you, 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 you're conscious that you're depriving other people of oxygen, but then what do you do? You just turn down all your speaking. And go, you know, you, you, you stop participating. Maybe, but then in a lot of situations, if you don't do it, I'm very conscious that if I'd say no, they're probably not going to ask another woman. They're probably not going to ask another young person. They might not even ask another African. So you get locked into these things. So my voice is way, way, way over amplified in the world. I accept that and I try to use it responsibly, but um, it's this whole notion of how we think about young people and leadership. You know, someone needs to disrupt that model in Silicon Valley speak. Someone needs to think of a really disruptive way of picking people that could be winners rather than the people that will win anyway. Which kind of brings in the diversity argument as well. I think you had a question. Great, thank you. Um, I hope my question is slightly easier but still relevant. My name is Fletcher Miles. I represent PYPP. So we uh, run an African um, governance leadership program in Liberia. Mm -hmm. um, and two things that you mentioned were that a lot of young Africans want to work in the private sector. Um, and then you were talking about how you can make the ag industry um, attractive by attaching like a label to it like tech. So um, one of the things that I want to ask is like firstly, how do you make the civil service attractive to young people? So young people come in and sort of bolster the civil service from a bottom up approach. And then how do you make those young people attractive to, to the leaders within the civil service? It's a great question. I mean. The elephant in the room is compensation, right? I mean, it's going to be difficult to attract really good young people until there's a reasonable level of compensation. And I really appreciate the Singapore model, which is not possible yet for most countries, where Singaporean civil servants are incredibly well paid. And I can't remember what the formula is, but they index against like what your peer in the private sector would be. There's like some formula, yeah. and they're incredibly well paid, and they're really, really good, and their country works. So I think part of it is a compensation issue, um, which then filters back to the corruption issue. I mean, one of our laureates, when he was a minister, was earning $4,000 a month as a minister, negotiating mining contracts worth billions. You can see where the incentive to be corrupt comes from. So until, we, look, we can't compete with corruption, right? You can always steal more than you can earn, but at least let's not make it's so asymmetrical that it's inevitable that people slide towards corruption. So I think we have to think about the issue of compensation. Um, what was the second point? I'm so sorry. So how do you make youth attractive youth to the government? To the I mean, I think competence is quite attractive. I think competence is attractive. Um, and I think you do see young people coming in and getting sort of pulled in by ministers and other people into their offices because they can deliver. So I think if you have a very competent cadre of young people going into, into ministries because there's a reasonable salary, 
I think they will rise to the top. Um, that brings up another question about sort of transparency of what qualifications do you need to have to go into government? Mm. Is the qualification simply that you know somebody in government that's going to bring you in, or is the government transparent? I know there's, um, I forget what the English word is, but you know, annual calls for come into the civil service. Right. How transparent are those in terms of the qualities people are looking for ranges across countries? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I said you can speak to country by country what those requirements are. Um, someone once said something really interesting to me about why politics is, why politicians are kind of naive. And I would extend this to the civil service. They said, McDonald's and Burger King have competed for what, 50 years? But they never destroyed the brand of fast food. Politicians compete and they destroy the brand of politics. You're a liar, you're this, you're this, and then you, we all just go, oh my God, they're all crazy. I want yep. nothing to do with any of this. And they destroyed their own brand. Um, and that's the issue. It's, it's, it's before you even get to wanting to go into the civil service, you kind of have to believe in politics. And mm -hmm. that's the elephant in the room. So. How do we restore faith in, in, in politics? It takes inspirational leaders. If I look at the continent today, I don't see very many. Right now on the, so I, we're gonna go over here, I'm on this side of the room, we're gonna start with someone in Zimbabwe who I think is trying to create that inspiration in a country that's very difficult. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Gwen, and thank you for uh, sharing with us your, your great experience uh, in this issue. Uh, my name is Nyarazo from Zimbabwe, working with girls and young women from a non, uh, with a non-profit called uh, Take a Life. And I'm currently a Rag and Fasol Fellow with the National Endowment for Democracy. Uh, I have two questions for you. Um, one of the key issues is that in Zimbabwe right now, for anybody who's been following up in politics, they, there's been an uprise uh, from the citizens themselves. Over the many years that have been going on, we've always seen that um, Uprising was in, uh, inspired by the opposition, but this time it's from the citizen. And uh, we've seen that uh, that was more inspired by us coming online to say, you know what, enough is enough of the corruption. And then the establishment of a hashtag called this flag where citizens decided that um, the flag of Zimbabwe for a long time had been misused by ZANU-PF, but we realized that along with that flag where things like natural resources had been taken to be... Uh, misused again by ZANU-PF and the state had been sort of, uh, it's still being sort of uh, run by ZANU-PF. Um, so there's usually no separation of power and all those things. And so the current movement has been established online through the use of Twitter, through the use of WhatsApp, and there's been a shutdown which was very successful on the 6th of July. But one of the key things that came out of that shutdown is the issue of the participation of women. Um, even through the uh, the calling on the, this flag campaign, as well as um, then the, the the actual going out, you'd find that women were relac were very reluctant to take part in that. That includes the women in the civic society as well, where I work. Uh, to the extent that I think at one point I went into one of the groups that I am part of, and I said, "Hey, look, leaders, you are the women leaders who are always telling the other women that they need to take." Uh, part in political processes or in, in things or citizenry issues that are going on. And there was that relaxation from the leaders, the civic society leadership themselves, even up to now. And so just tying up to that, how do we make sure that even the young women um, are interested in taking part in political processes or are interested in taking part in leadership and citizenry processes? And because along with that comes the issue that um, we then, at the end of the day, see a lot of men visible uh, in the in the uh, in the media, as if women are not doing anything. Um, so it, it's a combination of those issues that m had me asking so many questions, and to say, just to say that at this age, there's been a lot of uh, the impact of social media, and the question is, how do we make the masses in rural communities access um, maybe? Uh, things like smartphones, because that's where a lot of information is flowing from. 
Thank you. Okay, coming back to technology and, and women's women's access, why don't we take two more because we're going to have to have. I'm just going to grab my scarf because it's a bit cold. I'm coming. Oh, yeah. I'm just grabbing my scarf because <laughs> it's a bit scarf. cold. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> We've got the air conditioning going on. It's uh, August in Washington. I'm back. Okay, so we'll go right here. And then to prepare, we'll go to the gentleman in the back in the kind of salmon shirt over there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Barbara Simmons. I'm Dean of International Education at William V. S. Tubman University in Liberia. And uh, addressing the issue of um, the intergener intergenerational as well as um, how do we make sure that there's continuation in terms of the leadership. Have you given any thought to mentorship? Uh, some of us had a discussion once where we thought there might be the need to have a program that included current leaders as well as uh, potential new ones so that uh, maybe some of the young people could even be role models for some of the current uh, leaders as well as how going forward and because I've actually been approached by some some persons in government who want to have better uh, skill in terms of how they go about uh, being in service. So the question is really relating mentorship to those that are currently in office with those potentially that want to. And let's take that last question back there. Hi, my name is Benjamin and I am a Ghanaian uh, and a student at the University of Oregon. My question is this, Ms. Um, Mo, you, you, you made a bold statement stating that um, technology threatens the civic space. And uh, I, I felt that was bold, but I also have some form of disagreement with you somehow. Mm. Uh, my sister over there from Zimbabwe made mention of um, how in Zimbabwe they are using mobile phones and Twitter and spaces like that to create these forms of awareness. I, I know that the traditional forms of organization or social movement are there, but in Africa, these spaces, these um, technological spaces are providing avenues that are, you know, before we couldn't, you know, we couldn't, you know, you know, use those spaces because we don't have the resources. And now we just a, a, a mobile phone, you just go online and you're live and you're saying things that are going you know public and people are using those spaces so how do we um in my in my in my opinion i think there should be a way to 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 blend the two and not to have these binaries where it is it technology alone or it is just um social determinism or or something like that that is just something i wanted to share yeah we're back to the the role of technology again right um i'll respond to the last one first because it's just Look, I said in the end that technology is value neutral, right? You can use it for good, you can use it for bad. And I think our sister from Zimbabwe here gave some really good examples of useful applications of technology. I'm just issuing a warning that says there is another side to it. And as, you, as, as our sister here mentioned with the shutdown, in the end, in 2011 in Egypt, what happened? Mubarak said, shut off the internet. Shut it finished. I mean, all mobile phone operators get their license from the government. If the government says turn it off, they have to turn it off. So that's, that's, that's just the background that I'm offering, right? Which is to say these are wonderful forms of organizing and so on, but just be aware of what, your, what the platform is and the vulnerability of that platform and who actually, by oh, whose permission, power. that platform is allowed to exist. That's all I'm saying. But absolutely, to say that I am, I am a child of the mobile phone revolution, literally. So I speak to that point. Um, you know, my father was heavily involved in that industry. There's no question that the mobile phone industry has transformed Africa. And all these things that come off it have been wonderful. But I'm just injecting a note of caution. Is that fair? Um, on the issue of Zimbabwe. And yeah, women's yeah. reluctance, yeah. civil civil yeah. society and politics, and then maybe linking that a bit with the mentorship piece, because there's a role model yes. of mentorship, right? Sorry. Um, so we have some fellowships in the foundation where we offer young Africans with talent, winners, um, the opportunity to be mentored by the heads of global institutions. So we have one in the office of the president of the African Development Bank. We used to have the head of the World Trade Organization used to mentor one, but since Pascal Lamy stepped down, it's now at the ITC. 
and also the Economic Commission for Africa, the Executive Secretary mentors one. So we take three promising Africans and we put them in the presidential office and the president of the institution personally mentors them for a year. And I would say 80% of the people that have been through that program are women. So we do do some of that in real time. What and I think Um, if they came to us and asked, we would help. But I wouldn't necessarily presume to engage with a leader and say, I think you need some mentoring. <laughs> you don't feel <laughs> quite that comfortable yet. It's a call to have with someone. What are you implying? <laughs> so, I mean, look, we found this with our index. You know, um, people were resistant, people were negative. Once government saw that we were, that it was gaining traction, they, the governments that come to us and say, will you come and sit with the cabinet and explain how the index works and explain how we can improve our performance, fantastic, but it has to come from there. You know, we are not um, the governance police of Africa, um, but, um, but we'll work with anyone who's willing. So I think last point on the women's interest and then... Yes, and on, on Zimbabwe. Um, Um, <coughs> I think it's hard sitting in DC or in London or anywhere or in New York to make women interested in politics. I mean, we get back to the, the gentleman's point before, how do we build this, how do we build that? I mean, these are movements that are going to self-organize. Um, has to come from the women themselves. I mean, it, it, it does, you know, whenever we try to make something, let's liberate Iraq, let's do, you know, let's fix Libya. Let's it has to be controversial. Well, no, I'm just like, <laughs> it's, it's difficult to go in and solve for people. In the end, sustainable change is when people do things for themselves. And, we, and, and absolutely, you want to try and support and empower. But it's, uh, please, no, I want to hear your response. Okay, so um, the situation is that I am quite on the ground. I'm just here on yeah, the fellowship. Yeah. I, thank you. I'm quite on the ground. I'm just here on a fellowship a few months. Yeah, sure. And I remember where we said that this, this is a, a movement that has started online. Mm -hmm. And it can happen anyway. And the people that I'm talking about, the many people that has caught up, the many maybe the young people and the men that has caught up on this movement are online. They are not, we don't, you don't need to be in Zimbabwe. You can just be anywhere to participate because it would interest you to know that though it started in Zimbabwe and um, I mean, we ignited this and I believe I'm one of the people who started saying, you know what, I'm tired of people bringing the fifth, because the president himself is the kind of the person who sparked this when he said that 15 billion dollars, 15 United, 15 billion United dollars had gone unaccounted for from the diamond mining. And so there were, there were jokes that started on, on, online, Zimbabweans just joking about it, because people were not in, uh, empowered to speak out. And I remember I was very frustrated and, and I wrote online and I tagged, I take the number of people and said, I'm tired of people making jokes of things that we should be concerned about. We should speak out. And then that's when kind of people started. I think people had already been talking and then the coming of the hashtag. So I'm just saying as much as we went online and people went online from wherever they were and building this movement, I sensed a, a, a kind of a wait and see from the women's movement, I am, which I am part of, by the way. People were not very, even up to now, they're not very willing to just come straight on, on their fa Facebook because this is where the movement started and it's still, because people started posting their own um, videos, they would record videos and post online on Facebook. On So it doesn't require anybody to be in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. People, la the movement has gone across wherever Zimbabweans are right now. In the, in the United Kingdom, uh, the Minister of Finance was closed on by Zimbabweans in UK because they were protesting. So demonstra demonstrations have since gone across the world, wherever Zimbabweans are. But I'm just sensing that even the women, it, it just crossed my mind that we then gather as the women's movement later on and say, oh, women are not represented. Oh, opportunities are going to the men. Oh, media coverage. But we, in the moment, we are all, as much as we are women who are leading a movement, we are still stuck up in wait and see. We are not brave to, to, to actually jump on the wagon and say, you know what, we're going to be part of this history.
But I think that brings up, just to tie up the, the sort of technology dialogue we've had today about the use of technology, the, the be aware of technology, and then the sort of who holds the power piece of it. I think um, we've heard a lot today about risk management, risk taker, being a disruptor, um, and yet taking responsibility across sort of youth, technology, governance um, in general, across the continent, changing the ni dialogue, changing the narrative. And I think um, I can thank you, Hadil, and we're going to wait to see where the Africa Center comes out as the, as, the, as the convener and the dialogue on, on some of these hard issues that I know you struggle with, with the foundation, with the Africa Center, and with all of the hats you wear. So thank you for taking time to discuss with us today uh, your viewpoints. You. Thank you very much. Thank you much. very much. Thank you all.